uh, there was a little um, upset, a little ripple in the pond, the smooth pond of CEC life this week when I sent my uh, message outline to Michael who suddenly got very concerned because it's not the same title as he was expecting. But if you take away nothing else from this morning's service, I'd like you to take home the title. Because the problem with church is that we come and we look at other people and think, oh, they're so good. They've got it all together. They know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They know the Bible from cover to cover. And I'm sure they never have the issues that I have. We're considering godly guidance. We're considering that how those of us that are believers, those that know the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Saviour, uh, can go through life making decisions, big decisions, small decisions, life-changing decisions, some of them, uh, how we can get them right. Uh, and we clearly need God's guidance to do that. And it would be nice to think that what we do is that we... Um, have a prayer to God and God answers our prayer, audible voice or big flashing lights in the sky or in some other way we have such clear direction that we can't get it wrong and we're somehow motivated to do exactly what God tells us to do. If you are sitting there thinking, yeah, that's, that's my life, uh, perhaps you'll explain to me how that works a bit, after, a bit later on because that's not the way it works for me. You see, last week we heard of a, a, an account of a prominent man in the history of the nation of Israel. Nehemiah heard that while he and most of God's chosen people had been taken captive by another country, a small remnant of the nation remained in a now decrepit capital city, Jerusalem. The walls were broken down, the temple was in ruins, it was just a dreadful place to be. And having prayed about the situation... Uh, God prompted Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem, set about the rebuilding and reinforcing the city so that it again would, be, would again be fit capital for the returning nation. And we sat in amazement last Sunday morning and thought, well, that's the way God always works with his people. He always gives them clear instructions and they get on and do exactly what he says when they say and it all works out fine. But I have to tell you, that's not well how it happens in my life. So we're going to consider another Bible character. We're going to consider Gideon. Uh, perhaps a reluctant uh, Bible hero, Gideon is, but he is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is a, a list of great biblical heroes. Uh, and in verse 32 it says, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and so on. Here's the list. Uh, more in this chapter too, great heroes like King David. He, he's among this list here. King David a and Samuel the prophet who stood up for who he believed in, stood up for God. And the question is, as we think about Gideon, is does he really fit among this list? Is he really a fit person to be among this list of great Bible heroes? If you don't know the story of Gideon, well, you heard half of it earlier on in the service. Phil read the second chapter. If you go back to chapter 6 um, of the same book, you'll find out a bit more about Gideon. We're going to touch on that as we go on, uh, and as we answer some questions, which I hope will be helpful for us as we consider uh, how God guides us. So let's make a start. God has a heart for humanity. You see, before we get any further, we have to come to terms with a loving Heavenly Father who cares about us. Who cares about us whether we're believers or not. Whether we come to this church or a different church. Whether we have no faith at all. Whatever our faith standards or setting or position, God cares about us. And he cares about us so much that he sent his one and only son to pay the price, death, of the things that you and I don't do so easily every single day of our lives. 
I know it's a shock to you, but even the person sitting next to you this morning does wrong things. They think wrong things and say wrong things and do wrong things. Uh, you can't look at them and think, no, they're perfect. The person sitting next to me, absolutely perfect. No wrong at all. In God's eyes, we're all sinners. We all do wrong things. And so, we need to, we need to help each other, help ourselves understand that God knows that we're sinners. We can't hide it from him. And that we need his help and his guidance. So God has a heart for humanity. He saw a need. He sees needs and helps, wants to help to sort them out. In Judges 6.6, 6, the previous chapter, it said, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. God's people who had been taught of his love and goodness for them, had decided they knew better than he did. And the consequences was the nation was overrun by their neighbours who exploited and enslaved them. It's a common theme in the Old Testament. God's people not doing what God tells them. God's people being enslaved or being thrown out the land or being taken captive or all sorts of things happened to God's people in the Old Testament because they didn't do what God told them. As it's a common theme in all of our lives too. God loves his people, the people that he made, and he promises to be with us always, even when we fall or are frail, but sometimes that has consequences. He has a plan and a purpose for us. He wants us to represent him. But sometimes it doesn't work out quite that way. Matthew 28. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore, despite the call to obedience, he's still with those who love him, even when we fall short of his expectations. He will have mercy on us. He promises his will. In Psalm 51, it says, a psalm written by King David, who was, if you know King David's story, he was very close to God at times and very far away from God at other times. We read, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, block out my transgressions. And again in Psalm 86 he says, But you, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Now those are words that mean a lot to me, because I need that compassion. I need that abounding love. Because it seems to leak away. I get hold of it and I understand and then it seems to ebb away as time goes on. Things push in and things happen and and, and I find it difficult to hold on to those things. I find it difficult, but God knows. Lord, you are compassionate and gracious. Despite King David's waywardness, he knew and experienced God's love and compassion. And Jesus followed his father by showing compassion. Uh, And we read that in the New Testament, in Matthew 14, 14. We read, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. He saw people in need and wanted to do something about it. He saw sick people and wanted to help. When they were lost and without leadership, again in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus landed and saw a huge crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. We have a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son to put right the things that you and I do so easily every day of our lives. Wrong thoughts, wrong words, wrong deeds. He sent his son who was perfect to take away the punishment for those things that aren't perfect in our lives. And that's why we celebrate Easter. When we celebrate Easter, he came and he lived among us and died on a cross. 
he was killed because of the wrong things we do. Not because he done anything wrong, but because of the wrong things you and I do so easily and so often. And his desire is if I know him as my Lord and Saviour, that we should do the same. We should be kind and compassionate, Ephesians 4, to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ just as in Christ God forgave you. So there's an expectation in the way that we treat one another within the church. There's an expectation of the one another that we we do as we gather together. We we don't put on our best Christian faces, because that's no good at all, because people will see through that very quickly. But in the love God gives us for one another, we respond to one another. The one another here is talking about the church, but there is also, and perhaps more importantly, the one another of outside the world around us. And in there too, we should behave as children of God, as forgiven people, as people who have understood what it is to be somebody that's far away from God, but is now close to God. We need to know the comfort and provision of knowing how we should behave, which is why Colossians 3 is a help to us. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Now, the world would say that those are key factors for anyone who doesn't want to get very far in life. The world around us would say you're not going to get anywhere if those are the way you treat other people. That's not the world in which we live. We live in a world where it's dog eats dog. All out for your own and don't worry about anybody else. You see, as part of God's creation, this is the way he wants us to live as God's chosen people, if we've got to that point where we've said to him, thank you for all you've done for me, I give my life to you, please lead and guide me, we are now wholly, dearly loved, clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. God knows that we're going to face difficulties, we're going to face issues and problems, but cause us to behave in all circumstances as ambassadors of the Creator God. Now, that might or might not be something that we've thought about before. But all circumstances, when that driver cuts you up on the end of the road just as you're trying to turn, as you're uh, the last last of whatever you want in the shops taken by the person immediately in front of you, as you're treated unfairly or unjustly by somebody else in your workplace, in all circumstances, if we know God as our Lord and Saviour, then we should clothe ourselves with these things. But God just doesn't sit in heaven and think nothing of things that go on, looking down and thinking, oh, they're doing very well down there. God, is, God actively intervenes. He, he's an active God. It's not just pie in the sky, get things running, that's fine no more to need to do. You see, back to, the, back to the story in Judges. The oppression of the neighbours has increased over time. The people had cried out to God and he'd responded to them. They got to the point where things were so desperate. They were having their food taken as fast as they could grow it. Their animals and livestock that they were going to use through the winter, they'd the enemies would come and take those away. They were being oppressed. And they cried out to God, and God in Judges 6 and verse 10 says, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you live, but you have not listened to me. You have not listened to me. God points out that they are the root cause of their own problems. But he says, I I, I have saved you once, And I can and will save you again. As a young Christian, 
when perhaps I thought more deeply about some things than others. I was, I was concerned about the possibility of losing my faith, of making an error, a mistake, and, and God not being able to put up with that, God not being able to cope with that, God being judgmental about that, and, and I wouldn't be a Christian anymore. Uh, talking to others, it's, it's not unusual. It might be something you've experienced earlier or perhaps going through at the moment. But God has a once-for-all transaction with his people. And if you come to that point in your life where you've become a Christian, you've accepted all that he's done for you, and you've sought to serve him in the best way that you can, he won't forget you. And God had told them, but you, you'd not listen to me. I, I haven't gone away, I'm still here, but you're not listening. God pointed out that they were the root cause of their own problems. But he says, I have saved you once, and I can and will save you from yourselves again. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And God's still intervening in our lives. In Philippians 4.19 it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. It's a not a once-for-all transaction becoming a Christian. It's not a once-and-all transaction in acknowledging God's uh, impact upon our lives. It's a continual changing and developing relationship. When I say changing and developing, I, I don't think, I, don't, I know it can't stop. Once we're committed, then that's the commitment. But we go up and down as human beings. Our emotions change. Our, our circumstances change. And sometimes we feel much closer to God than we do at others. But whatever our struggle and however we feel, God has promised us his presence, his support, and his answers. But there's a bit of an issue because his time scale isn't always the same as ours. My time scale isn't always the same as my wife's. Yes, darling, I'll get on and do that job straight away. Well, that's any time within the next three weeks, really. Uh, and, and like my wife, no, she's not impatient really, like my wife, she, sometimes we get impatient about his time scale because we want to ha it to happen in our way and in our time. We've prayed about it once, so it's going to happen now. And sometimes he's teaching us other things. God always wants to restore us if we let him. He always wants to get us back in a right relationship. He always wants to put us straight. He always wants us to be where we're listening to him. But Gideon had a problem. Gideon had the problem, and his problem, his struggle, was that he looked at the world through his own eyes and not through God's eyes. So he thought when he thought, when he looked out, that God didn't care because he couldn't see him working. When he looked out at the problems that his nation was having and he looked out, he thought God just turned off and gone away. So when God's messenger came to Gideon, this was Gideon's response. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And you and I can do that sort of thing too. If we're believers, sometimes we think that God isn't working on our behalf. We think he's not listening. We think he's turned off. We think that things aren't going in the right way. Sometimes our surroundings and the world in which we live blinds us to what God is really doing. It's easy to believe that we've been forgotten or cast to one side. And when we do have genuine difficulties, we still have a peace with God, but not necessarily with the world around us. Do you know that? Do you, have you felt that? That while you feel as if you're in a turmoil, you just have that peace when you're with God. When later on in Gideon, and he saw the army of the Midnights, he described them in this way. 
Judges 6, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley uh, as thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sands on the seashore. They're in problems. There's a difficulty going on, and Gideon's prayed about it, and he's expecting God to do something about it. And he's expecting God to do something about it soon. And he's expecting God to do something about it involving somebody else other than himself. It's easy to become frightened and disappointed, or even disillusioned if we take off God, take our eyes off God, our Heavenly Father. If we make the problem ours and not God's. If we stop praying about it and start worrying about it. Guidance is, is great when it's going in all the right direction, but we need to be guided too when things aren't going so well. In uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, it says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Christ Jesus is revealed at his coming. And that has a future context, but it also has a present context. When we feel far away from God, when we feel Jesus has forgotten about us, it's, it's easy to live a life in that way and be very upset, very downcast about what's going on. But God wants us to set our hope and to know his promise that he will be with us. He's working in the background. He's got, things are happening. You see, we don't have to put our minds in neutral to believe that God does care and is acting in every situation. It's often our spiritual blindness that makes us think he does not care. Have you been there? You've been in a situation, you've prayed about it for a while, nothing seems to be happening, in fact it appears to be getting worse and you, you don't know where God is and you say, well, God, you don't care about me. Why? What, what have I done to upset you? God does care and he is there with you. But God equips Gideon. God's equipping of Gideon. His provision, he helps him in this situation. He helps the nation that uh, he's going to help Gideon save and restore. Judges 6.16 says, The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon did not need to worry about the how and the when and the what of God's blessing. He was being given a blessing. Did, did he think, well, when's it going to happen? What am I going to have to do? Which way am I have to go? What, how do I sort all this out? Gideon was a bit like you and I, that we do find it difficult just to let go and let God. We try and work out things in our own finite minds about which is the right way and which way the things could fit together and how this situation could be resolved if this happened and then that and then this and then the other. And at times we have to say, no, God is in control. He needs to be allowed to do it in the way that he wants to because he knows far better than we do how that should be. Gideon didn't need to, to worry about the how and the when and the what of God's blessing. God had promised him a blessing. God's timing and provision is always perfect. Ephesians 4 says, so Christ himself gave up, gave the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. As we come together as church this morning, we all have individual abilities, individual methods of serving one another. The individual believers are put together in the family of God to support and encourage one another. Sometimes that means that we will be the encouragers and that others will be those who receive encouragement. Sometimes we will share wisdom and sometimes others will share wisdom with us uh, and so on. None of us have all the blessings all the time. We're put together in church families to share God's blessings with one another. 
some of us think that we have all the, gift, all the giftings and all the blessings. And it's our job simply to download them to anyone who looks as if they uh, need something. Or, or, or perhaps give it to them anyway, even if they don't look as if they need it. Some of us feel that perhaps we float above everything and we don't need anybody else's help. And we have such a close relationship with God that that's really all we require. And God wants us to know that at some times we will be the one that's doing the blessing. And other times we will be the one in need, seeking the blessing. 2 Timothy 3 helps us. So that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, we're going to be thoroughly equipped to do what God wants us to do when we know how to give blessings, to give advice, to share with people, but also when we know to, how to receive those things as well. We'll be thoroughly equipped when we know what it's like to give as well as what it's like to receive. We'll be thoroughly equipped when we leave in unity with one another. Timothy had to learn from Paul by receiving from him and then he was equipped to share with others. That's how Timothy learnt. We need to look not at the world around us to set the standards of our behaviour but, but to go to our loving Heavenly Father and ask, what will Jesus do? How in this situation should I behave so that I'll be more Christ-like? How in this situation are you encouraging me to, to move? What is it you want me to do in this situation? Uh, and then respond to it. Some of us have trouble with guidance because we don't ask for it. And some of us have trouble with guidance because when it's given to us, we don't want to follow it. Neither are right. If there's situations in our lives in the, with the relationships of the people around us or uh, with any aspect of our lives, we do need to ask for that guidance. But we need to receive it when it comes to. Both Nehemiah last week and Gideon this week were being empowered and directed by God. Nehemiah seems to have found the waiting and the watching, the trusting and believing a relatively easy task. But not Gideon. He wanted to do nothing with the plan that God was laying before him. Nehemiah, last week, got the things together, got the information, prayed over it, went and saw the right people and was off on a way to help. But that was over a long period of time. It didn't happen overnight. He waited on God's providence and waited for him to move. But Gideon thought, oh, this is all too difficult for me, God. I, I, I'm really not sure why you've picked me for this job. And wanted to hide. Kept making excuses. Kept pushing it away. He, he wanted good things for his nation, but he wanted somebody else to bring them about. He wanted God's will to be done, but not me, God. Choose someone else. Gideon tested God again and again and again. A meal prepared was placed on a bare rock and then consumed by fire before his very eyes. A work of God. But that wasn't enough. And again, he wanted more. He wanted more signs. He, he wanted to see a, a, set, a sign set by his own parameters about a sheep's fleece in the early morning that it should be wet while the ground around it was dry and then the other way round. Show me, show me. He was trying to satisfy himself rather than trusting in God. He wanted to intellectually understand how this thing was going to happen without trusting God to take the next step. He wanted to know the result. He wanted to know the end story before he was prepared to take the first step. And God had to say to him, you're not going to know that. Gideon was put in some very 
uh, difficult circumstances. God started to help Gideon to trust him for a, a future role and responsibility and first gathered an army of 32,000. Well, that's a great start. It's not enough yet, God, but this is a good start. Gideon must have thought as he looked at the size of army that was amassing. Now, there's several nations out there that we've got to go and sort out. So, yeah, 32,000, yeah, good start. Let's, let's get some more before we're ready to go. We might think that was a reasonable army, but God wanted Gideon and us to know that he is in charge and he can do anything. So he told Gideon to let go, though, let go those that were frightened. He told Gideon to tell the men that were there, these 32,000, not enough to fight the battle as far as Gideon was concerned, to let any that were frightened go. And so he did. And that reduced the army size to just 10,000 against several nations. But God said that was still too many. And step by step, God was helping Gideon realise that it wasn't his imagination that was not needed. It wasn't his plan and purpose that was needed. It was God's plan and purpose that's important. So a final test of their methods of drinking water in a pool by a spring resulted in just 300 men being selected to take on the Midian hordes. Now, I don't know about you and the things that God seems to be asking you to do at the moment or in the past. But I have to, uh, I have to admit that I'm a bit uh, careful. That's a polite way of putting it. I, I like to know the ins and outs of the, what's going to happen. I, I like to know how it's going to go, where, where it's going to start and where it's going to finish. I like to know the direction I'm travelling. I like to know all the answers before I step out. But God often has other plans for us. It's not that he's not guiding us. It's not that we're not listening to him. It's not that he doesn't know our situation and doesn't know what we're really good at. He knows all about us and all about the circumstances and he's asking us to trust him. Trust him. Take away our human sight. Take away what we think and feel and trust God. So Gideon's left with 300 men. And what he does with those 300 men we saw in the reading this morning. You see, God's got a bigger picture than we have. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all about us and all about our circumstances and all about what his plans and purposes are, things that we can't even imagine. In uh, Judges 8, it says, The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. See, God wants with his people a relationship that's a one-to-one -one relationship. Yes, he does want us to come together as believers in churches and support and help one another. He wants us to fellowship together. He wants us to learn how to serve one another so that we can do that in the wider world as well but he wants a one-to-one -one relationship with us so that what he tells us, we do. And that we're obedient to him. You see, in the end of our story, this poor, weak, scared man led the nation of Israel to a great victory. We first meet him in chapter 6 of his lowest ebb. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. In Judges 6.11 it says that the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abazite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. You see, when God chose Gideon to lead his people to victory, he was actually hiding the wine press is a hole in the ground where the grapes are trodden to release the juice which is contained within the pit and so is easily connected. And he should have been on a 
hard platform where the ears of the corn can be beaten with a heavy object so the husks are blown away and the grain stays where it is. This man that he's chosen to be a great leader of the nation, this man who he's chosen to lead an army that's going to have a great victory, is hiding away. Doing an impossible job because he's in the wrong place doing it. But God turns him around, despite himself. God leads him to a great victory. From a frightened boy to a warrior who with a few men defeated a, na a nation who in uh, Judges 6.5 are described as they came with their livestock and their tents and their, uh, like a swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. And sometimes God does that with you and I. Sometimes what he asks us to do doesn't make any sense. And we see the great army. We see the impossible odds. We see the stupidity of what we're being asked to do. Or so it seems in our finite brains. But Gideon had to learn to trust God. Trust him again and again and again as he took him through that process of reducing the army to just a few, 300. Because God's going to use Gideon in this instant with a small number of men with pottery jars and trumpets and lighted torches to de defeat several nations worth of warriors. God knows what the plan is. God knows what his purposes are. We have to be obedient. We have to say, yes, God, if that's what you're asking from me. In Exodus it says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand still. What's it like in your life when there's a problem? Have you learnt to stand still and wait for God? Or are you out there trying to sort it out in your own strength before he even knows what's going on? Sometimes we need to wait a while. We need to wait and to listen and to be obedient. Isaiah says, The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. That's God's promises for you and I as believers. If we're believers, that's what he promises us. But we need to wait and to listen and, obe and be obedient. And that's a difficult balance, isn't it? I'm back to the three weeks before I get around to doing the job that I just told my wife I was going to do straight away. It's back to knowing what God is actually telling us and how he wants us to do it. It's about trusting when we have, have been told and doing it just as he says, rather than waiting and trying to manage it in the way that we would. Well, I wouldn't do it quite like that, God. I think we ought to try it this way, don't you? Oh, we will then. He has a plan and a purpose for us. God used this young man with all his faults and failings, with the fact that he thought it, it was a ridiculous thing to ask him to do, somebody else in the nation should be doing it, not him. He, he used this man who was so scared that he couldn't get on with the job straight away, he had to kept, keep asking for signs. He used this young man who would have been thought of as being weak and feeble by the army that he was trying to put together. He put all these things, and there was victory. On Sunday evenings, we're looking at the book of Acts. It's a great series. I, you, you've missed some already if you haven't been yet, but please make an effort to come. They're really worthwhile. Uh, and, and in Acts 2, we found a huge advantage that we have over Gideon and over Moses and David and all the other great followers of God before the event described happened. We know that if we've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour and our Lord, he will give us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. 
These people didn't have that. That's special for us since the Lord Jesus died and sent his spirit. We no longer have to wait on someone else to bring us God's will and purpose for our lives, but we have the Holy Spirit within us to lead us and guide us and direct us. We have a direct link to our loving Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit. As we draw to a close, let's remember what King David said in Psalm 52. But I'm like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. I'm like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. Are you flourishing this morning? Or are you a bit under pressure? Are you a bit wilted at the edges? Are your leaves a bit brittle? A bit brown? A bit seedy? Are you trusting God's unfailing love? Or is that a bit hard for us? Are there things happening in our lives that make that difficult? You see, sometimes it's not necessarily our fault that we're in dry conditions. Sometimes it's a, it's a stage in life we're being asked to go through. But we are responsible for whether or not we allow God to be involved in the situation. Gideon struggled almost every step of the way to allow God to use him. He made excuses. He, he didn't think God was doing it the right way. He wanted to do it in different ways. He fought God nearly every step of the way. He focused on the problems rather than looking at the solution that God was signposting. It's not easy to look at the signposts when you're in a difficulty. You're more worried about where your hands are on the wheel or which foot's on the right pedal. But looking at the signposts is really important. We all sometimes find it difficult to follow the guidance God has given us. But he is faithful and he works with us to fulfil his purposes in and through us. if we know him and love him as our Lord and Saviour, if we come to that point in our life that we've talked about where we give our hearts and lives to him, he will always love us. He will always watch over us. And he will always lead and guide us. However distant it feels, however distant we've moved ourselves, that's the truth. So when we read some of the stories in the Old Testament or even the New Testament about how people were led and guided by God and it all seems to happen really fast and they were really obedient and it all happened really, really well, just remember that God has to put up with us leading and guiding us. Particularly when we're hard-headed, self-willed, want to go our own way, stubborn. Let's pray before we move on. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your love and your care and your concern. We thank you that as we look through your word, we see the way that you individually lead and help people to know what your will and purpose is. We thank you for the fellowship that we have here and the ability we have to ask other Christians to pray with us over serious matters, serious decisions that need to be made. That we will hear your guidance. We ask that you'd help us to be those that listen and are moved by your will and purpose. Help us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.